Coming up on this week's show, Britain's biggest ever gaming show is coming back, but will it be any good? A new Donkey Kong 64 cheat has been found. And we're joined by roleplay gaming legend, Brenda Romero. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, at the moment, why don't you treat yourself and check out some of their amazing visual compendiums covering systems like the NES, Super Nintendo, Sega Master System, Commodore 64, and their brand new book that celebrates Game Boy box art collection. Have a look on their website and tell them that we sent you at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 262, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it's Friday, our favourite day of the week when we get to talk about and get all geeky about classic video games. Yeah, I was thinking actually, obviously today in 2021, there are loads of ways to get gaming news and opinions. I mean, there are loads of great retro gaming podcasts out there. We've got loads of websites, brilliant YouTube channels as well. Back in the day... You remember, like, you know, trying to find out gaming information when you were a kid. It was a bit more limited back then. I think, it, yeah, it was very limited. There were a few shows on TV. There was a, a magazine out occasionally. Like, now, as soon as something breaks, it trends on Twitter, or it's all <laughs> over the internet, or everybody's talking about it before you can even share the news. Games even get, like, cinematic trailers now, don't they? They get, like, the yeah. trailer of the trailer. You know, like the two, <laughs> the two second snippet, and it's the like teaser come, before the draw, yeah, the, te- the teaser before on a game, and you're just like, oh my god, come back here for God of War two kind of thing. But yeah, it was a bit different back in the uh, early nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I remember reading. Obviously, I got my my magazines I buy every month, you know, my pocket money, and then really there was two big gaming shows here in the UK that were on every week, you know, at certain points in the year. One was Bad Influence, the other was Games Master. Now, we've done entire episodes all about them before, but the big news that we need to talk about in just a minute is that Games Master is apparently coming back. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. Honestly, if you live outside the UK, we can't describe as what a big deal this is you know, for us of a certain age here in Britain. And also this week on the show, we are going to be joined by an absolute legend. And in fact, someone that we've wanted to get on this podcast since we started it over five years ago. Yeah, this is Brenda Romero. And my God, Brenda is an amazing developer. She's been developing since 1981 and started when she was 15 in Surtec, and Surtec's a company that we haven't covered that much, but you know we love to talk about adventures and role-playing games. Well, Surtec had that great connection with Dungeons and & Dragons and also went on to create the Wizardry series. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Brenda ended up doing Wizardry 8. She she kind of was involved with every single game, and as technology advanced, uh, so did the Wizardry series. And, it, you know, this is just a fantastic talk about the kind of fantasy role playing and and how it's kind of grown to a much bigger level and this interview that we did with brenda um you and i did this one ravi um and she's incredible such a good storyteller i love it when we have guests and we can just set them off and they've got all these amazing anecdotes to tell and obviously someone with her experiences worked in the games industry for like you know four decades my word we did well to fit this into an hour i think yeah, totally. And uh, you may recognise the Romero name there because she's married to the uh, Doom guy. Well, the guy who created Doom, yeah. John, <laughs> not the guy in the game. <laughs> no. <laughs> who, of course, we did have on the podcast years ago, so um, it is going to be incredible to get some stories from Brenda. Our special guest, she's a BAFTA award winner as well. And um, Brenda Romero coming up on the Retro Out podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now let's get straight into the biggest story of the week in retro gaming here in Britain. Of course, we're all talking about the fact that Channel 4 is reportedly rebooting Games Master. Now, of course, we did do an entire episode years ago with Dave Perry, who was one of the um, main stars of Games Master, and also Dominic Diamond, that was actually one of our most popular episodes we've ever done. We had Dominic on um, last summer. But I think, you know, for people that missed those episodes, Ravi, kind of explain, you know, too, because we have listeners all over the world, what a big deal Games Master was here. Yeah, so Games Master ended in uh, 1998. So that's basically, you know, 23 years ago. And there wasn't much on television then. So uh, there was hardly any gaming info. You know, TV's always been a bit kind of dismissive of uh, gaming TV. now, Or scared of games, maybe, you could say. Yeah, yeah, they've been scared of games as well. Mm. And uh, Games Master was huge. Like, it was in the top 10 
of Channel 4 franchises, like, out of all of them. And See, I didn't know that. You said that just before we recorded. I didn't realise how big it was. Yeah, if you weren't a viewer, were you, Joe? You never watched it. No, I'm, I'm, I've mentioned it before. I'm, I'm a little bit, I would have been, when it finished, I would have been eight years old. I do remember seeing it on TV. And I remember getting frustrated at the celebrities they used to have on who couldn't play the game. Um, well, so, it, so, yeah, but I do, I do know what it is and everything. And I know how big of a deal it was. It ran from uh, Series 1 to Series 7, which was 92 to 1998. And basically, when they ended it, it was getting 14 million views. And like, if you think now, commercial television, there will be so is, that, is that fourteen desperate. million an episode as well? Yeah, yeah. And that, so that is big. Will, That's really big. Yeah. They will. Well, be, you think now? Yeah, you know, a prime time Saturday night TV show on BBC One is lucky to get what about three million now? A lot, a lot of the time, thinking you know, Britain's Got Talent and X Factor, they're only pulling in about that now. Well, yes. I remember when I was about ten years old, the Who shot Phil Mitchell in EastEnders, being like, "Wow, I got ten million views," mm. and even that was the nineties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for it to like, be getting regular fourteen million, that's crazy. And if you look at the recent revivals that they've done, so. They did Crystal Maze, which they did really mm. well. They redid the whole set and everything. That was one of these top 10 franchises as well. Crystal Maze was a really, really big thing. So I think if they do this, they're going to put some considerable amount of money in there because it's it's pretty much one of Channel 4's kind of flagship series and it's, and it's legendary in its uh, kind of history. But uh, what is this announcement before we kind of start talking about it? Well, let me tell you the details. Now, this is, um, it was a note on Channel 4's sales website. So um, I think this is where they're trying to get advertising for like, you know, upcoming programs that they're doing. Um, And they're seeking a brand partner for, it says, Games Master will be a social first show followed by an E4 transmission and an all four box set. That's what the pitch starts with. And the saying, the official blurb is um, five bold celebrities are going to embark on a gaming odyssey, but only one can go on to become the Games Master Champion and take home the coveted golden joystick. So they're going to be doing challenges, races, and fights in virtual battles across all genres of gaming under the watchful eye of the all-knowing Games Master. And it says each week, one celeb is going to be eliminated over three episodes. Five will become one, and the winner will be crowned. And they're going to play everything from iconic classic video games to brand new releases, and they're also going to be serving tons of extra gaming-themed content to keep their audiences coming back for more. So So that's the official blurb. So a couple of things, like Games Master was pretty adult. Like it, as it grew, as it got later in the series, it got yeah. ruder and ruder and ruder. And like they had kids in the studios cheering along and stuff, but it was always like innuendos, um, dodgy Innuendo. guests. Yeah, <laughs> they even did a a, a gore special, um, which yeah. was on late at night, and they wanted to do series eight as a late night series. So I'm just going to quickly go through the locations that they had. So series one was a church, second one was an oil rig. Third was a prison. Then we don't it, talk about number three. That was the, no, no. <laughs> then it was heaven, hell, Atlantis, and then a desert island. So I'm wondering how they're going to theme the next one. And is it going to be aimed at kids and adults? And who's going to present it? And who's going to be the games master? You see, I think they're going to aim it at adults. I think this is going to be a on at nine o'clock at night kind of thing. You know, like, I mean, what time was Crystal Maze on? That was like on in the evenings, wasn't it? The new tea time, yeah. Two tea, tea time kind of thing. So I think this will be the same. But obviously, we're only getting three episodes of it. But I'm, like Ravi says, I'm interested to see who's going to be the games master because the rumor, there's been quite a few rumors, but the big one's Patrick Stewart because he's in the artwork, isn't he? In the pitch. In the pitch, yeah, yeah. Um, and he's actually on the website as well, but it's just the pitch. That's just like a, you know, this is who, you know, it, this is a, a perfect celebrity kind of thing for it. But I just don't. Personally, I don't think they've got the money for him. Ravi's twisting my arm a little bit with all those facts and figures that he just threw out there. <laughs> so I'm a little bit like, and he is in a lot of stuff at the moment. So well, well, there's who knows? always been there's always been a thing about the games master. The games master was Patrick Moore originally, and yeah. he knew nothing about video games. It's like the games master actually doesn't have to know yeah. anything or, or be knowledgeable, but the host has to be really good to kind of. Mm you know, get the whole thing going, be cheeky. Mm-hmm. And, and Dominic Diamond was the last host and uh, we, we interviewed him about it. And uh, there's plenty of options for hosts as well. Who do you, who do you think uh, would be a host? Like, I've noticed lots of people online kind of talking about it, but no one seems to be mentioning people like Dave Perry or 
or the older Games Master staffers? You know, like again, it depends who they're going to target the show as. You, th- you know, you think when Dominic started it, he was like in his early 20s. And, you know, some people have been saying Dominic, when we interviewed him, did say that he was moving back to Britain. And I think if he got offered the job of coming back to the show, it might be something he'd do. And I think they would get a lot of kudos from the original fans if they brought Dominic back. But then if they're going to aim this show at, like, you know, teenagers, they probably wouldn't have any idea who he was. You know, I, I think it's too little too late as well. Like, whatever they do, people are going to complain. I know it's hard to I say. Think, I, for, I think that's no. why they're only doing three episodes, though. I think they're just kind of going to go, here's just three episodes. We're not, we're not doing two seasons of 20 episodes or anything like that. I think it's just a little bit of fun during lockdown. I think D- Dip your toe in the water and yeah, see. Yeah, I feel like see. the celebrities, because it said something on it about, like, how it's going to be, you know, embarking across a virtual odyssey or something. I think they're going to be doing it all online like they're going to be in their own homes doing it like during lockdown so i think one you mentioned ravi but he obviously did crystal maze was richard adiodi i think they might go for him again yeah i mm-hmm. think they might go for someone a bit more edge lordy like cause, um you know dominic was really edgy like i mm. personally i'd love someone like frankie boyle or something but i uh, i think they need to have a at least a little games connection even though dom really didn't know that much <laughs> about games he just read off the script and, you know, for Patrick Stewart to do it, um, you know, we, we were talking before the show, like, could they afford him, for example? But I remember Patrick Moore was a very unlikely choice, being that he was a, a world-famous astronomer. I mean, you know, that's what he was famed for. But, for, you know, from what, what I understand, all they did is they got him in the studio, you know, to do a voice service session one afternoon before the series to record it all. So really, it would only be hiring Patrick probably for one afternoon mm. to record it all. So maybe a, a three-hour job, which, you know, yeah. bearing in mind, he's been on shows like Extras and stuff in the past, you know, it's not out of out of this world that he'd do it, I don't think. Yeah, that's very true. You know, I, c- I could imagine he's not going to, you know, demand like a million pounds for an afternoon, is he? So, I mean, he might do, but I doubt it. So, yeah, you could be right. Um, you're definitely twisting my arm with it. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to cringe at what celebrities they get to actually be on the show competing and how see if they're going to be any good at the games. Well, people have been talking about the celebrities and that's the big backlash I've seen online. But people forget. I mean, God, they had like, take that on the original series and Melinda Messenger and people like that. I mean, it wasn't like, all right, they had the kids playing the games as well, but a lot of it was, you know, cheesy boy band of the week coming on. Admittedly, Dominic Diamond had kind of ripped them a bit and, you know, that, <laughs> that got us all laughing at, about it. But there was a lot of kind of z celebs who go on it back then. And, of course, you know, Vinnie Jones, whenever they were desperate for uh, <laughs> somebody, he was always on the phone available. So, oh, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Times, <laughs> Oh, I think it was about six, seven times, I think he was. Oh, there, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but apparently, um, yeah, they'd just ring him up and they'd be like, uh, he'd answer the phone, how much? <laughs> That's it, you'd be on the next trade down. Uh, but I think, you know, it might be people like, you know, Gemma Collins and people like that who would appear on this. It wouldn't surprise me. But then other people have been saying that's going to really turn it into just a, a knockoff of Go 8 Bit. Gemma yeah, Collins wouldn't, it's, it's... wouldn't surprise me at all. We had her as our celebrity guest for like our Christmas party last year. Oh, I'm so, so... sorry. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's weird, you know, because like I think I think don't don't kill me, listeners, don't kill me. But I think uh, there's a bit of rose tinted glasses with Games Master, you know, because I've sat there and I've watched it back and blooming excellent Blasphemous. episodes. Some episodes are boring, like massively boring, like you know some of the challenges and stuff. So yeah, it, it all depends, doesn't it? And uh, you know, you're never gonna you're never gonna hit that nostalgia of someone when they were a 13 year old kid sitting there watching it on a CRT TV and getting excited about Sonic Three, are you? Well, that's the thing. It, it was very much a product of its time. You know, it's an it's to me, it's a 90s time capsule when you watch those episodes back on YouTube. So people are expecting that, which is always a danger. There's not been very many kind of reboots, particularly with something like video games that is very much of the time. You know, if they're not going to be covering many retro games, bring a Crystal Maze back, you can kind of remake that as it was in the 80s, and it'll be quite similar, but you Robot can't do Wars a gaming show. Good yeah, again, I mean, back. a show that you yeah. could you can do that the same as it was back in the day, but you can't do... I mean, gaming's moved on so much since the 90s, and it's, it's going to be a different show. Yeah, and they, they might have to do a mix of retro and modern games, or, you know, like... If it was all just Fortnite or, yeah, mm. <laughs> how would that do go Fortnite. down? They're definitely going to do Fortnite. When it said it was going to be retro games and modern games, I was like, well, Fortnite's going to be on there. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're definitely the kind of uh, battle royale survival mm. games will, will come into play. But also that kind of, that whole thing of sitting there watching someone play a game, like that's Twitch. 
You know what I mean? Like, what is there that much appeal to it now? Like, you know. And are there going to be screaming kids in a studio going, yeah? I don't think, like I say, no. I think they're doing it from home. Bringing back this brand, I just think it's kind of destined to get slagged off if it's not exactly like the original series was, which wouldn't work now. It's uh, it's weird, though, because, you know, as gaming fans, we've complained for years that there isn't enough gaming coverage on TV. And now it's here, we're sceptical. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> We're a fussy bunch. You can't please us, but no, um, yeah, you really I, can't. I, I don't envy their task. <laughs> no, so we we haven't got a date for it yet. But I mean, obviously, we'll be keeping a uh, very close eye on that. And um, anything we hear, of course, we'll be talking about it on the show. And uh, we'll link up the story in our show notes at theretrohour.com. dot com. Now, lots more stories to get through this week as well. It's been a very busy week for retro gaming news. Now, Nintendo Giga Leak seems to be the gift that keeps on giving, and now apparently. Some fans have restored the original Super Mario World soundtrack from it. Yeah, so a uh, a Twitter user called uh, the Brickster um, has essentially got the original like stems from the 1990 um, Yoshi's Island Super Mario World, um, and essentially he's used all the the original synths from the the original um, soundtrack made by uh, I think his name was Koji Kondo's Koji Kondo, uh, and essentially he's programmed it on something called a loss a lossless synth i think it's called and got the original uncompressed music so what it would sound like when he kind of like submitted it to nintendo you know in 1990 before it got compressed and put onto the snes and he's uploaded pretty much like five tracks from super mario world in this uncompressed form onto youtube and they sound beautiful have you listened to them i've had a little listen through and it does sound re- mm. really awesome and it's kind of nice having this uh uncompressed it's like you know um when they do a remaster or a yeah. remix of a soundtrack with a, yeah. a kind of more range and more depth, it, it, it does sound like that. Yeah, it, it, it still sounds Nintendo, of course, but it yeah. hasn't got that um, kind of chippy sound. You know, it, it was funny because I was listening to it and I was like, "Oh, that sounds beautiful." And then like the trumpets came in, and I was like, "Yeah, that's Mario. <laughs> <laughs> like the, that's Nintendo. That's the Super Nintendo." But yeah, it sounds really cool. And I think, you know, obviously, if you're a big fan of that game, that's going to be something that you played so much as a kid. And I think that's one thing about video game music, particularly of that era, you know, when, you, when you're a kid or a teenager, it just transforms you back then. It's so ingrained in your memory. Mm. And hearing something, you know, that original version before it got compressed into the game without the limitations of the old hardware, yeah, that, that's pretty mind-blowing. The, yeah. the Giga Leak is the leak that keeps giving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, know? I was going to say, we're, we're probably it seems to... I feel like the Giga Leak can keeps coming up on the show like every other week at the moment like another things come from it like oh here's here's some more stuff from this game or something like that so i'm sure it'll just keep on giving it is a shame that things had to come out that way <laughs> and you know mm. nintendo didn't just put it up there for everyone to enjoy but yeah i mean we'll, we'll keep pillaging that for uh as much as we can get out of it i'm sure now again that i didn't play uh, but 16 years ago on the xbox there was a game called stubs the zombie and apparently he's going to be coming back yeah, um, so Stubbs the Zombie was a really, really fun game, which I feel like didn't get enough love, but it was a um, Microsoft-developed game, and it was only on the original Xbox. It never came to 360, never got ported to PS2 or anything like that. Now, we've we've not heard from Stubbs, like you say, in 16 years, and now all of a sudden, True Achievements, the website, have found that it's on the Microsoft Store, being released on March 16th, with no information or anything at the moment. It's just an image of the box artwork um and apparently the game is coming on march 16th no price or anything like that now i'm really curious because i really enjoyed this game me and my uh, best friend at the time me and best friend richard we used to play this all the time because it's a really really fun zombie game for those guys for people who have played it they'll be like yes yeah, the zombies right now so i'm really interested to see if they're going to do anything with it if they've just kind of slapped it on xbox one and just gone yep there it is it's on the game store go play it or if they're going to do anything with it, if it's a remaster, if they've done anything with the graphics or anything like that. But for those of you who haven't played it, essentially you play as Stubbs the zombie and you're causing a zombie apocalypse in like 90s, 50, 1950s um, like America. Oh, is it like a B-movie style? Yeah, it literally right. it is like B-movie style and like all the people you eat and stuff, like you literally turn them into zombies. So you make like a horde of zombies running around. And you can just do silly stuff like you can rip your arm off and then you can run around as the little arm. But if you jump onto an, and you know, onto like an army guy or something with your arm, you can then control them and run around shooting and stuff. And it's like a third person shooter. It, it's a really, really fun game. You can like bowl your head and stuff like that, like a bowling ball and stuff. Um, and it's just got that really silly kind of like 
humor in it as well like when you're eating zombies like the characters scream like he's eating my brains and stuff like that (laughs) so it's that silly like 1950s zombie style you know 1960s zombie style well, looking here at the comments on this article as well, I mean, a lot of people are saying that the original game is actually really expensive if you try and get hold yeah. of it now. It's quite a rare game. Yeah, it's about 50, 60 quid. Um, wow. And I've not got it. It was my friend who had it. Um, so it's one of those games I've always been like, oh, I want to play that again. And, you know, having it on Xbox One is going to be really cool because it'll probably be like 15 quid or something. And also I get the achievements because achievements have ruined games for me now because I always want to get them. These style games always look really fun. I mean, again, this is one that I, I mean, looking at the artwork, I do vaguely remember seeing it around. That was kind of my gaming wilderness years. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it does look like it'd be a lot. Yeah, I, I recognise him. It's, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's got like a real Destroy All Humans vibe to it. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever played any of them. Like the graphics are very similar to that. Yeah, I mean, again, we don't know if it's going to be a, a new game. I mean, it might be a sequel mm. or is it going to be a reboot of the original? I mean, we'll have to mm. wait and see till next month, I guess. Um, going to be out in March, apparently. So um, we'll link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now from zombies, what about other supernatural beings? Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Now, how does she relate to a, a 68k accelerator then? Yeah, so there's a new 68K accelerator coming out. And uh, we know that 68K was used in so many machines. And it this has come from the Amiga community. But, um, you know, the Apple Mac used 68K, Atari... This was a CPU, yeah? It's, it's yeah, a CPU chip. Atari SC, uh, Jaguar, you know, um, Mega Drive. Lo- loads of machines, basically. And w- what this card is, is it's really cheap... And, uh, you know, accelerators for the Amiga and accelerators for these machines have had a high price tag for quite a long time. Now, what this card actually does is it's got an ARM chip on it. And crazily, it's for the 030 CPU. Now, it has a goal of hitting 3.2 gigahertz. Which <laughs> now bearing in mind the original was what seven megahertz, seven megahertz. So this card can basically boost any of your 68k machines which have a socket in there, so you know you can actually replace the chip. It boosts it up to 3.2 gigahertz, which is absolutely mental. And it also comes on with like 512 megabyte RAM or a gigabyte of RAM. The funny thing is, like, none of the operating systems are actually going to be able to read this or there will be no software for it because it's so ahead of its time. The The, the great thing about this is the price as well. So I've been looking at this and, and, and this accelerator, you know, you'll be able to drop it into many machines. For the 512 model, it's uh, £100 and wow. uh, it's about 130 for the 1 gigahertz, uh, for, for the 1 gig RAM. Because normally these are like, what, I've seen like six, seven hundred pounds. Yeah, so, so the closest rival would be in the Amiga world, which was called the Vampire. But that does mm. a lot more function. So yeah. it does like HDMI out. It's It's got loads of different functions. And uh, they're eventually hoping to add more later to this project. So adding stuff like HDMI, Wi-Fi, Ethernet. But first they want to get the board out there. And interestingly, they've... Uh, done it really quickly so the board is actually nearly ready produ- for production so check it out at buffy.ca from images i've seen it's only a little bit bigger than the original chip yeah yeah it's 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 a little bit bigger you just drop it in and then i guess you can flash it and update it with the um latest stuff and uh yeah i'm really excited about this more cheap hardware the better and you know imagine if they start uh putting these chips in mega drives and all over the place and you sit in there playing a three gigahertz game <laughs> on one of your old consoles. It's mental. See, we were talking about this in our patrons hangout and that was a question everyone had like, oh great, but what can you do with it? But I guess, you know, if the prices are that low, it probably means there's going to be quite a big install base in a few months. So then people will start developing software for it. Yeah, but also like the chip is updatable itself. So maybe you can say on the chip, like, oh, pretend that you're a, an 060 card or, or pretend you're this so that the software works with it straight away, which means you don't have to do which what they did with the vampire, which was go through and edit all the software to then work with it. They were calling it vampirizing and, like, you know, turning this piece of software to actually work with it. It might just do it all on the chip, which is a 
really nice little solution. You know, whenever I do videos about like, you know, Amigas or Mega Drives or whatever, there's always some smart ass in the comments who goes, can it run Crisis? And the answer might actually be yes. Yes, if, uh, yes. I can run Crisis. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it is awesome to see hardware like that coming out, though. So uh, looking forward to getting my hands on one when they become available. Now, before we get into our chat with uh, Brenda Romero, just uh, one other little um, Nintendo story that we, uh, we spotted this week as well. There's been a Donkey Kong 64 cheat discovered after about 25 years. Uh, yeah, so 21 years. Get it right, get it right. <laughs> so <laughs> the game came out in 99. Um, so we don't know whether this was actually discovered by somebody before, you know, before the internet and YouTube and stuff like that. But it's never been posted before. And it's it is nothing too magical or special, but it's just interesting that this has never been posted before. So we can only assume it's never been found before. Is it down years. to the Giga Leak? It is. No, it's not down <laughs> to the Giga Leak. <laughs> but I was going to be like, it is. But no, it's not down to the Giga Leak. It's just been uploaded on to YouTube. Um, so pretty much, have you guys played Donkey Kong 64? I'm guessing yeah, not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. So you've got like your hub world and you've got like your levels you go to and you've got to collect golden bananas to unlock the levels. They've got like giant padlocks on them. And essentially somebody has found if you stand on the pad, if you've not got enough g- bananas and you stand on the pad and all you press is up, down, left, right, you will hear a homing ammo, um, like a homing, the ammo like sound effect for when you pick up ammo. And it enables a developer function so that you can just go through it, even if you don't have the bananas, and you can go into the level even without the the stuff that you need for it. So you can just skip the levels and go in because it's like a like not open world, but there's like hub, you know, it's a hub world, and then you pick what world you want to go into, like the desert world or the the woodland world, and then when you go in there, you collect golden bananas to unlock the next level. Um, but yeah, if you just do up, down, left, right. You can just skip that and just go into the world, and it it like reduces the amount of bananas you need from like the video that I've watched, um, which I'm guessing the developers would just put in there so they can just test the game, test the levels, and get around quickly. This is gonna open the world up for speed running on that oh, game. Oh god, if, yeah. If you you don't have to collect stuff, you just go yeah. through it all. And, and it's uh, a yeah. massive game, Donkey Kong sixty four. It's a huge, huge game. So that's probably why it's in there, just to skip the worlds and stuff. But it's just funny, up, down, left, right. Like, it's nothing crazy. Like, you just stand there, up, down, left, right, I'm in. Right, let's go. <laughs> you know, I miss that about games, just having simple cheats like that. I mean, again, thinking of Games Master coming back, you know, coming back to the beginning of the show, the consultation zone when it was like, how do I skip to the next level? They've so got to do it? that somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, on Fortnite. <laughs> how do I but do games that? don't normally have it in anymore, do they, those simple cheats? No, so they don't, uh, do they, unfortunately? That's the point. Does the, the Ravi, does the latest pro skater still have cheats? Tony Hawks? I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to work oh, he's not got that far yet. <laughs> Somebody will tell us in the comments. I've not played it yet. But yeah, no, I <laughs> thought that was a little cool one. 21 years and it hadn't been discovered till now. Still surprising, as mm. yet. Very, very cool. Now, we have got Brenda Romero coming up in just a minute. Now, before we do, just wanted to take a quick second to give a massive thank you to one of our very dear friends who have sponsored this week's episode of the Retro Hour podcast, and this is the wonderful Express VPN. And obviously, if you've been spending a lot more time at home over the last year, you may have heard about VPNs. They protect your privacy and security online as well. But not only can they keep you private, but also they can take your TV watching game game to the next level because you might not know this but a vpn can actually unlock movies and tv shows that are normally only available in other countries i know you've been uh, checking out a few shows that we haven't got here in the uk on the american netflix revy yeah so i, I totally love express vpn because it's really fast so even if you are watching the tv shows on american netflix then uh you know it, it there's no lagging there's no kind of buffer and you can do it all in hd now i've I've been checking a few shows that aren't available on the uk one so uh one that i love stargate sg1 oh what what a good series um the twilight zone as well the original i used uh, to love that twilight zone series and if you're up for a laugh and uh uh, just a really stupid movie. Um, Beverly Hills Ninja is is a wicked one, uh, a classic film, and you can check that out. You know, using Express, you can kind of unlock all these extra movies and extra content. Because we've been sat at home, and I tell you what, I've rinsed my Netflix. 
Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's actually over a hundred different Netflix services all around the world with different libraries. I mean, if you love anime, you could use ExpressVPN to jump straight into the Japanese Netflix and, you know, be completely spoiled on there. And not just Netflix as well. It works with stuff like Hulu, BBC iPlayer, YouTube as well. You know, there are often YouTube videos that are blocked in certain countries. And there are hundreds of VPNs out there. But the fact that, you know, we love ExpressVPN, because like you said, no lag, it's ridiculously fast. Never any buffering or lag or anything like that. Stream HD, no problem at all. And also compatible with all your devices. Put it on your phone, your consoles, your smart TVs, and you can watch wherever you are on the big screen or the small screen. So we want you to check out ExpressVPN for yourself and get three months free on a one-year subscription. And of course, be helping out the podcast by doing this. So have a look right now. Tap this into your phone or your computer, expressvpn.com slash retro and get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. Support the show, watch whatever you want and protect your privacy as well at expressvpn.com slash retro. Now, just a quick heads up as well that we do have a patron running as well. And of course, we did our latest episode of the Retro Hour After Hours podcast that came out a bit earlier on this week that was actually us picking games for each other. Oh, it's really good fun. You know, I, I really enjoyed playing those games. And I, and I think we should do another one as well, where we get the patron listeners to actually yeah. pick titles for us. And that's going to be oh, even more fun. Idea. That's a really good idea, yeah. actually. I love that. It was very eye-opening doing that episode as well. You know, because we kind of um, you know, tried to guess what each other might enjoy. And, uh, you know, we didn't always get it quite right. Uh, sometimes we did. So um, we kind of picked games that we really enjoy and got each other to play them and give mini reviews. So it was one of my favourite episodes that we've done. And, of course, if you're a patron, you can check that out right now. Um, you get your custom RSS feed by joining us on Patreon. So you put it in your podcast client. You can play all the episodes that we've done for patrons only. You also get the normal podcast, often a bit early as well you get it without adverts or anything like that and of course the main reason to back us on patreon is that you'll be supporting this show and anything we get on there goes back into the running of the podcast and you will get a mention in a future episode in the very prestigious retro hour hall of fame like this week thank you to ole johnny devick bryce l tomlinson alan purdom Gary Broadhead and Scott Brian Frazier who all made donations into the running of the show and if you'd like to do the same you'll find it right now on our website at theretrohour.com Right, we'll have more news for you next Friday Next though, you're going to really enjoy this one We're joined by BAFTA award winning video game developer Stories about Surtech, the Wizardry series and being a developer in the games industry since 1981 The wonderful Brenda Romero is next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for our favourite part of the show where we welcome on this week's very special guest. And what an honour it is to be joined by our guest this week. We're going to get some incredible stories about some incredible games as well. So let's say hello to the wonderful Brenda Romero. Hello, Brenda. Hi. Hi. Thanks. It's great to be here. Fantastic to have you joining us. Now, um, before we get into your experiences in the industry over the last couple of decades, I mean, let's kind of go right back to roots. I mean, what initially got you into video games and computers was the one that kind of really captured your mind oh man well so we are going a a good long ways back um with that question so i the first computer isn't that weird um the first time i ever saw a computer uh my mother and i'm pretty sure it was a used computer it would have been a used vic 20 and she brought it home and i just started like many people do i just started typing things in out of magazines and what would happen if I changed this number? What would happen if I changed this around and uh, learning a bit from there? And and I should should add that I just loved it. I loved code, even if it was something as trivial as changing, you know, I don't know, something from black to white, uh, or I guess is the case, depending on the color of the monitor, right? Then the high school gets in computers and I take a programming class in basic so that was super fun for me. Um, I don't know why it, it never felt like schoolwork. I just, I just took to code, absolutely loved it. If I fast forward a little bit through that, I, I remember uh, about a year in, the school is also very eager at this point in time to integrate computers into the schoolwork. And because this is you know, back in the dinosaurs times, uh, there were no word processing software. There, there, there wasn't, if you wanted a computer to do something, you had to write it. So the school was was all about getting kids to do that and said, well, you know, if you can 
if you can write something uh, uh, that will help you in your final exam and can prove that you wrote it, you can you can use it. So after I scored a series of uh, perfect scores, that was the, <laughs> the beginning and end of that policy. But you know, I, it just it just made me love computers even more. Um, so now I'm the ripe old age of 15. I am in. I grew up in northern New York, I should add, which is uh, Surtec uh, was located in Ogdensburg, New York. So uh, Ogdensburg, New York is under snow for, geez, feels like 11 months out of the year, but it's probably closer to five. I was in uh, that, and I also, these are horrible. The, 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 what I'm about to say, nobody should do any of these things to get a job in the game industry. But I was uh, smoking at 15, uh, and because it, it's uh, Ogdensburg is under a, a blanket of snow, I'm smoking in the school bathroom, uh, which I'm also not allowed to do. But another uh, another young woman happened to come in there. Uh, it was Linda Saratek then, Linda Curry now. And she was looking for uh, a non-menthol cigarette. And so I gave her one. She, you know, I, I, and, and just to be polite, she struck up a conversation. Um, you know, did I, did, I have a, had I, did I have a job? No. Had I ever heard of Surtec? Also no. Had I ever heard of Wizardry? Also no. Um, but then she hit the magic question, which was, had I heard of D&D? And I had. I was a dungeon master. And so that was pretty much the beginning and ending of my interview to get into the game industry. Uh, and I started my job just a couple of weeks later, and I was with Surtech for 20 years. So Wizardry was, from the moment I saw it, uh, was a love affair. Uh, and there's no other way to put that. I was, you know, especially, you know, I think about like my own kids, you know, for them, when they see color, uh, they don't think twice about it when they see something animating in the game. You know, they're looking at things that are like, you know, The Last of Us, right, or of Red Dead Redemption, you know, too, and and just these, you know, these incredible cinematic games. But for me, um, the only thing I'd ever seen computers do uh, was text, you know, text and lines and circles. And and so when I went to, uh, when I first saw Wizardry on the screen, that moment will stay with me for the rest of my life because it, maybe it's like how people feel the first time they experience VR. Maybe that's how it is. But I was absolutely blown away by what I saw, uh, and it changed my life. It was just magical. Well, even before uh, D&D, uh, you were creating board games as a child as well. So you had that kind of creative mind. Uh, what, what kind of games were you making, and uh, what, what were the stories about? I, you know, it's so, it, it, so yeah, I, I was making board games from a really early age. And I, while I would say that there's probably – there are very few benefits, in fact, to growing up uh, without without a lot. Um, my family, uh, my father had passed away when I was pretty young, so it was just me and my mother. And, and you know, she we lived on we made do on Social Security income, which was which was pretty small. I was re- I was really young when he passed away, as I mentioned. So uh, so it was I guess it was just you know it was the I can't remember the actual phrase, but maybe po- poverty was the mother of invention in my case. So when we would go to uh, we would go to garage sales or uh, yard sales, tag sales, whatever you call them, and she would give me uh, a dime, and with that dime I could buy whatever I want. Except of course you're not going to buy any actual games. So what I would do, I just I started buying games and I would take their parts and use the back of the board and make up games on my own. Uh, they I don't remember and I don't remember what what any of them were about honestly. Like if you gave me like, I, what's the topic? A, a desert. Okay. And I would just start making a game about it. I didn't even care. I didn't even care if it was good at the time. Like, I just loved the process of creating games. Um, and I I was recently telling the story about, oh, geez, maybe I was 10 or so. Uh, it was before I started playing D&D because I remember, the, I remember the, the party that this happened at. So either nine or 10 and someone gave me a brand new Monopoly game and I was so excited. I opened the game, flipped the board over and said, what do you want me to make? <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, like what the, what the heck kind of response is that? You know, um, but it seemed perfectly normal to me. And I still, you know, I still to this very day have a giant collection of game parts. 
Well, we've had so many developers talk about how D and D, you know, really impacted the rest of their career, and actually, what a huge influence it was on the creation of video games in general. I mean, oh, how, yeah. was D and D a massive influence on your life then? It was. It was. I mean, it it, it is. Uh, it it still is. You know, I I can't imagine who I would be without without having passed through that. I guess you know part of my story that I'm that I'm leaving out, but it is it is. Uh, I guess it's like the more personal side of it. Uh, well, okay, that makes no sense. If it's my story, obviously the whole thing is personal. But it's like the non computer side is that. Just before my mother got me that computer, and in fact, the reason that she got me that computer is because there had been a misunderstanding uh, among a group of friends. So one of the friend group, um, as this is, you know, this is what kids do. One of the friend group took some of their parents' liquor, got caught, and blamed it on me. And that stuck. So I found myself at, at a young age with no friends, no friends that I could hang around with. So uh, so I moped at home for a while. You know, things eventually r- r- right themselves in that situation. But during this moping phase, my mother, um, my mother decides, well, look, if you're if she's going to be exiled at home and you know, sort of mope around, maybe maybe the best thing to do is just to get you know get her get her something. So so somehow she she managed to get this Vic twenty, uh, and that that was a huge part of it. And then D and D. D and D comes along, and to me that that changed everything because I, it was I already had an overactive imagination, and suddenly this gave me a rule set for that overactive imagination, uh, so I could build anything. In fact, I didn't need to go outside, and I I <laughs> going outside is absolutely fine, and I probably still didn't need to go outside, but I I just loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, and I would say, like, I know D&D was uh, was critical to to even, you know, my husband's career. Like, Quake was a character in D&D. Uh, the name of id Software, the I and the D in that, originally come from uh, the name of their D&D group, which was In Demand. Yeah, so it, it, D&D is, is, you know, just, I mean, it's kind of like the parchment on which this industry is is written. Hundred percent. We've had so many guests that talk about D and D and how instantly they transferred into the industry. Yeah, it's even when we're looking to still to this day when we're looking to hire game designers, I always I, I have a bit of a question if you know somebody well yeah no I've never played D and D how how have you have you never played D and D because I consider it to be to me it's a foundational text of the game industry it is it is it's abs- it's just necessary it just it um, yeah, it's just a, it's a foundational text. It's critical. Well, when you joined Certec, um, you, you were using the Vic Twenty before. Um, you, did you start using Apple II machines, and uh, you learned Pascal? I understand. I did. So I well, I started using Apple II machines, and that was one of the great benefits of joining Certec. I mean, there I had access to technology that there's zero chance we could have ever afforded. Um, and they didn't have a problem with me, even though my hours initially were from four to eight. Uh, I would come in for oh geez, I'd come in as soon as I could get out of school, and I would stay as you know stay as late as my mother would let me stay. Um, I you know and I had the benefit of working around some some great people like Robert Woodhead, uh, you know, who is uh, obviously uh, one of the co-creators of Wizardry, or Arthur Brito uh, for Rescue Raiders. You know, I I worked you know in the well. You know, I can't say right next to, there were, uh, a, it, we, I worked in the same office. There were several places that were all in, in part of the Ogdensburg Mall where, where Surtec was located. How big was Surtec? Like, uh, what was the atmosphere like back then as well? So I, well, when I first started the company, started the company, no, I didn't. When I first, <laughs> when I first started at the company, hmm, I'd say there were probably 20 people, maybe, um, the development was even Robert Woodhead was there. Arthur Brito was there. So there was some development happening at the time. There was marketing, PR, accounting uh, in, you know, the, the executives and founders of the company and then production. I, my job was uh, pre-internet, pre-FAQ. So I was the FAQ and people would, you know, I would, I, I mean, can you imagine being 15 and getting a job like this? Um, I just had to memorize the games. 
And uh, when people called and asked questions, I would tell them what the answers to those questions were. And I still, to this day, those questions and answers are so deeply embedded in my head. I can still, uh, if people ask me questions about wizardry, I can still answer them as if I were on the call. Um, but there, I so I find out that wizardry, I, I now basic, I feel like I've done everything I can do in basic. It, it, you know, many programmers, especially back then, realize that they can only do so much with basic, especially because basic is slow. So I wanted to know what the next thing was that I needed to do. And I knew um, that wizardry uh, was written in USD C Pascal. And so that to me seemed to be the next thing I needed to learn. And so I absolutely, I begged, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I begged, begged, begged the, um, the high school where I was at to please offer a course in Pascal. So that was the next programming language for me. And then when I went to college, I, I took assembly language. But coding was, um, you know, for me, I, I ended up on the design side, which I regret. In fact, I can say, well, wait a minute, let me correct that. I don't regret being a designer. I love being a designer. I regret letting go of the code. Um, I wish I had kept that up. Uh, and I often look back, I, I look back to like, why did that stop? And where did that what happened there? And I think part of it was that I had access to a program that Robert Wood had, had developed, which was a wizardry editor. It was uh, just basically you could make mods, you could make your own levels. So it was a tool for you know, other people uh, on the wizardry team to create levels and content for the game. Uh, but for me, you know, it was it was like somebody brought the D&D &D rule books to life. And, you know, that's what I needed. I suspect if I hadn't run into that, that I that I would have absolutely kept going down the assembly language route because I was doing all the same things that every other, you know, every other coder at that point in time was doing. Well, we did a whole episode of our podcast last year about this system called Plato um, mm -hmm. that I know is a really powerful um, networked computer platform. I mean, did you have much experience with, with the Plato system? My experience with Plato is 100% watching Robert Woodhead play uh, I, I, Oubliette and maybe Empire. I, and I remember, uh, I remember being fascinated uh, just watching him play. But no, I mean, I wouldn't have had, uh, I wouldn't have had access to that outside of Surtech. Well, you were at Surtech, I mean, for eighteen years. You must have some really fond memories of that company. I mean, any any that kind of spring to mind? Um, geez, I mean, you know, I'd say I, I think the, you know the the biggest benefit for me. Um, well, there's several. I mean, I have you know some lifelong relationships. Uh, friendships that that come out of that um, that's that are fortunate uh, that I'm you know very grateful for, you know I also think it was especially when I think about where I came from right so northern New York which is, you know predominantly rural it, it you know uh, I think farming is probably the biggest employer the odds of me getting in on the on the ground floor of the game industry. Um, were uh, were were certainly against me, and you know the fact that I came from uh, a poor background, you know, I, I wasn't going to be I w the odds of me having ever seeing an Apple or or you know an IBM at my house were that was never going to happen. Um, but the the thing that I the thing that I that I love is remembering, you know, being able to see like I'm I'm. I'm a, I guess as every game designer I know is kind of a freakishly curious person, and Surtech allowed me, uh, you know, just the company in general. I remember just walking in and asking Robert Woodhead questions about stuff, or um, asking uh, Norm or Rob Surtech their thoughts on, you know, why are you doing this specific thing? What is the Software Publishers Association? What's the difference between the SPA and, uh, or not, sorry, uh, the RSAC rating and um, the ESRB ratings? And really being like, be having a front row seat to the very early days of the industry that we can look back on that sort of stuff now as, as history. Uh, and I just can't believe I was so lucky to be there. So incredibly lucky to be there. I, when I think about just, there's so many, you know, there's so many great memories I have of it. Overall, like I loved, um, I loved working with uh, working with David Bradley. I mean, Wizardry Seven to this day, I, I still think it's maybe the greatest RPG ever made. Absolutely loved it. It's Crusaders of the Dark Savant. 
having an opportunity to, you know, to, to work on Wizardry 8 was uh, fantastic and, you know, to be uh, being part of the design team for that. Um, it, I loved working. So uh, with Jagged Alliance, you know, uh, working with, um, you know, Ian, that's Ian, uh, Ian Curry's uh, and Sean Ling and Linda Curry, um, you know, seeing when that game, uh, when they first started making that game, remembering, you uh, having this kind of ridiculous name, like, what are we going to call Jagged Alliance? And for some reason it was, you know, me and Linda uh, eating popcorn, coming up with this giant spreadsheet of possible names, um, which I think I'm assuming that, you know, she and Ian later went through and, you know, th those are the two that, those are the two that came out, but it's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to crystallize that many years. Um, and there's, there's like, I think there's a, a couple of things that, that really that I remember from back then um, that that will always stand out that one of them is there was a tester. So you'd have to know wizardry to, to know this, but there was a tester um, who, who his, his desk was right outside my office. Uh, and you know, that way he was, he was really, he was really emotive, right? So something happened. Oh no. Right. And, or, Oh my God. So whenever I would hear something, I would hear what happened and, there was this one, mo there was some time he I said, so what are you, you know, what are you doing today? What are you working on today? And he was really of the belief that he could get these two total enemies. They had been enemies, you know, they had been enemies in Wizardry 7. They were enemies in Wizardry 8. The, this, the, it was fire and water. These two were never going to come together. And he somehow believed that there was a way to get them together. And the reason he believed that is because uh, he realized that he could work for both of them for a long period of time and neither one seemed to complain about it. Uh, and there was never a mission that caused them to go at cross purposes. And so he thought that was intentional. It, it wasn't. I like, I just, just hadn't occurred to me like, you know, at some point in time I should shut you down there. So he, he really felt like he was pursuing this, this stream of uh, design that didn't exist actually. And then I thought, but you know, I could make that happen. And so, uh, so I did. And at one point in time, uh, and I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it away how the game tells, but there's at one point in time, uh, you can be not at one point in time. It's actually many points in time. You can be found out. And when you are found out the reaction that I knew he was probably expecting is that, you know, it'd be fire and brimstone and the other group would, would trash him. And instead what happens is if you do get found out the, the opposing leader actually, who is a kind of a fire and brimstone guy, you know, says that he really trusted you. He, you know, he viewed you as a confidant and he's, uh, and that, you know, you've, you've, you've heard him, you've let him down. And it's like this, this really cool moment that I, that I it only made cool really, because I happened to see his reaction when it happened. And he just, I, and I sort of suspected he was going to be coming up on it. Um, and he just leaned back and he was like, Oh my God. And seeing you know, seeing that happen in games, um, in something that you've created, you know, that stuff will stay with you for a long while. But, I mean, you know, there's so many memories. I mean, the introduction of the Mac, the introduction of the Apple II, sorry, not the Apple II, the Lisa, here comes the PC Junior, now we're up to PCs, Pentiums, I mean, consoles, you know, um, seeing Wizardry, uh, you know, just go, uh, just be become you know, freakishly popular in Japan, you know, in the, in just the, you know, the business acumen that Norm Saratek had with making sure that happened, you know, they were, I would say overall as a company, they were, um, they were really, really open to the extent you can be. Um, I mean, they weren't, you know, they weren't putting out salary sheets for people or whatever, but it, as a, as somebody who worked there, you really had a sense of what was going on. You had a sense of the industry and, you know, if you were like me and you were a curious kid, uh, you know, you, you could see whatever you wanted to see. I do, I, just having said that, I, I do remember probably the, the funniest moment in my, um, in my whole thing was that, you know, I, at the time, because we're talking, you know, and now we're in mid to late 80s, you know, late 80s, I'm graduating college, uh, and this was the time for me to go out and get a real job. So I am interviewing at IBM. Um, and I remember coming around this corner, it was in their Atlanta campus or one of their Atlanta campuses. And they said, so you would be revising DOS manuals. And I just remember thinking like, I don't want to, I don't want to revise DOS manuals. Like, you know, there's, there's another 
there's another wizardry game in development or like there's, you know, there's a bunch of different stuff going on. I want to stay working in games. And at this point in time, especially because, uh, Surtech was really isolated. Um, there were no other game companies in Ogdensburg, New York. Uh, I didn't even know what that really meant. Um, in Surtech, uh, you know, the, the founders of Surtech knew that I was going out to do this. They, you know, they totally supported me. Um, you know, they thought this was great. So after my interview, I remember coming back. I remember Rob Surtech stopping me and saying, "So how'd it go?" You know, and he was excited for me. You know, like kind of, kind of like a, you know, a, like a brother might be. Right? How'd it go? And I just said, "Well." I think I want to keep making games. And he said, okay. And that was it. You know, we never had another conversation <laughs> about that you know, for 20 years. You mentioned the kind of success of uh, wizardry in Japan there as well. How much do you think like the roots of it um, being an early computer helped when you were porting it for the Game Boy and, and kind of getting into that different console market? Well, you know, I think wizardry, you know, not necessarily, you know, the porting aspect of it, but, Wizardry, wizardry was foundational in JRPGs. I mean, even uh, you know the developers of Final Fantasy will say that. And wizardry in Japan, it hit a a really unique chord. So, I remember, um, I remember in our office we would regularly hear about. Uh, there's a TV show about wizardry now. There's a you know there's a wizardry orchestra. Um, here's here's um, a CD of music from the wizardry orchestra. Uh, it it was you know, it was a it was a phenomenon, um, uh, you know. When I and I do I don't mind you without having anything you know not I I didn't have the, a look at the books, but you know I suspect through some of Surtex's more lean years um, that uh, the business in Japan and and you know the the royalties I'm assuming they collected from Japan really went a long way toward uh, sustaining the company. Well, as the Wizardry series grew and have, you know, had more feeling, more atmosphere, how did Surtech improve these elements and grow the game? You know, it's, it's interesting if we look at Wizardry, like the whole series, right? Um, so we have from one to eight, we have WYSIPRINT, which allows you to print out your characters. We have uh, Wizardry Nemesis. And then there are the various console versions of the game, uh, but those those exist beyond um, beyond Surtech proper. Um, and so, how does it how does it grow? And I think I think now we have the benefit. Like if we were starting now and we said, "Geez, we just had this really successful game. Let's do a follow up on this game." We would, you know, there's a there's a pretty established formula in the industry about. Uh, you know, this this percent of the game, say, needs to remain the same. This percent needs to be improved and, and this percent needs to be new. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying here. But back then, like we're talking the early 80s, there were no formulas. There was no, you know, there, there wasn't prior art one would point to to see like, oh, when when so and so had this really successful role playing series, this is what they did or or any series for that matter. Um and so how Surtec did it, and, and I and I have spent a good deal of time studying what I think was the number one competitor to the Wizardry series, which was the Ultima series. And Wizardry yeah. one, two, and three were derivatives, right? So like, well, well, one was one was the initial explosion, and then playing Wizardry two, you had to have Wizardry one to play Wizardry two. So you're selling to a subset of that audience. And then wizardry three was, was a subset as well. So again, you had to have wizardry one in order to buy wizardry three. And that really means sure. There probably are some people who did go out and buy wizardry one as a result of it, but it didn't mean that the audience was likely to grow massively from product to product, right? It, 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 it choked off like, Oh, this is, it choked off part of it. And because the tech, because the tech itself didn't look different, um, uh, you know, I, I think too, like you were, whereas you were kind of getting more of the same type of thing. It was more like, you know, Doom episodes two and three versus feeling like you were getting a, uh, you know, it was, it was almost a DLC. Now that it, if they, if they made those exact same games today, they would be called the DLCs, not full sequels because they required the main game. Whereas Ultima continued to you know, iterate the whole and what they shipped, you didn't have to have Ultima 1 to play Ultima 2. And so I feel that their market 
grew faster. And in fact, I've talked with uh, Lord British, Richard Gary, about this before on a number of occasions. Um, then, uh, and, and then with Wizardry 4, it was now, nowadays we would call it Massacre. Um, so Wizardry 4 was meant to be a really difficult game. It was standalone, but meant to be really difficult. And, you know, the, the, for many players, they didn't necessarily want that thing. And you weren't, you weren't, you know, part of the attachment to wizardry as I'm, you know, I'm sure you well know this yourself. Part of the attachment was the characters that you created. And I, and I still regret this. I'm about to tell you about this ridiculous thing I did. I saved my wizardry one disc from 1981 until 2006. Oh, wow. And and I remember it was, it was a red disc. It didn't even have a label on it, but if it's a red disc, it didn't really need one. Five and a quarter inch disc. And I remember thinking like, why am I keeping this? There's no reason to keep it. I still regret, I still regret getting rid of it. What an idiot idea. And I, and I threw it away because it made total sense. You know, like it made total sense to do that. Like they're, they're not, there's zero chance they're still on the disc at this point. Not to mention that I didn't at the time have an Apple II anyway. Um, and, but I still regret getting rid of those characters, you know, and like, listen, you can even hear the language that I'm using that I didn't do that on purpose, but I regret getting rid of those characters. I didn't, I just got rid of a disc. Right. And, you know, but, but I, but those characters, I had had them for, you know, played with those same characters for years. So at, after wizardry four, uh, that is the end of the Robert Woodhead wizardry games. And then we enter in, uh, David Bradley's games so that's heart of the maelstrom and uh andrew greenberg is listed as a co-author on heart of the maelstrom uh then we have wizardry six bane of the cosmic forge and then wizardry seven crusaders of the dark savant so david's work uh david was not based in ogdensburg david was uh from atlanta and i have to say i loved working with david um you know back in the back in the early days of the industry uh, there, there was, you weren't going to go to a college to learn game development, um, or to learn, and there were really no books about it then. And, you know, David to this day, I would say, you know, was, was easily, uh, you know, one of my most important mentors because he was so generous in, in having discussions about things or, um, you know, he would, he would ask me like, look, if you're, if you're playing the game, can you, let me know how you feel about this specific part and, and, and how this works. And, um, uh, and, and there was a, just a really great, even though he wasn't on site, there was really great two way communication where I would, you know, be able to talk with him about, uh, like I, she's, I, I can't even remember what level it is, but I want to say it was, uh, I don't remember what level it was, so I'm not going to try. Um, but there was no a worries. level in heart of the maelstrom where I remember thinking like, Jesus, this is just way too tough. Um, or in one case, I had arrived at a level far too way ahead of, you know, way ahead of uh, planned schedule. Right. So he was surprised that, you know, how did there, I think there was an item that you needed to have to get through something. And I was too low level to I had the item, but too low level to use the item. So he realized that he needed to have a whole hell of a lot more, you know, combat before that phase. Um but, you know, other things like when I told him, uh, because I played the game seven million times, it felt like by that point. So I was trying ridiculous things. Like I, I had a, a party of all female fairy ninjas, um, which is just the most ridiculous possible. Like a fairy, <laughs> all a fairy ninja. I, I have zero regrets for that. But I, I remember word for word the conversation. You did what? A fairy ninja? And he just thought that was crazy. And so, but he, <laughs> he made, uh, I think it's called the Corpus Christi, which is a, anyway, he made a weapon that was specifically uh, for fairy ninjas and only for fairy ninjas. Um, but yeah, so with David, we start to see the, you know, the, the standalone wizardries that if, sure, if you did play the previous wizardry, you could import your party, but, um, but the game itself was standalone, which was really necessary, you know, because, games games change uh, games change a lot you know like what what we consider like not not just technically either right but what we consider to be an acceptable design choice or how do you how do you penalize the player how do you show the player they did something wrong um like can you imagine now like let's go back to wizardry one 
if your character dies, you try to resurrect your character. If the resurrection fails, your character is turned to ashes. If you try to if you try it again on the ashes and it fails, your character is deleted forever from the disc. Can you seriously imagine? Can you even that, imagine no continues. That? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, like, um, you know, and so like, I remember, uh, at Surtech would get letters just, you know, from people who were like, I've had this character forever, please. Is there anything you could do to say, and, you know, and it was like, people were, were really just, uh, I remember, I absolutely remember taking calls from people who were crying because their characters, uh, and I'm making it sound like I have a judgment on them. I was just the one talking about reg- regretting getting rid of my disc, right? Like, um, uh, which you can tell by the fact that I kept it from 81 to 2006. I held on to it, you know, a good long ways anyway. But they, so, so we, anyway, so there's a new Wizardry then. And then with Wizardry 8, we changed it yet again. And that's where there's, you know, there's some things we, the design team for that, uh, you know, we had some things that we knew we needed to do. Uh, we needed to keep because otherwise it wouldn't be really a wizardry, but there were also some, some things that we really had to, um, we really had to change just, you know, to stay up with the times and to keep the game current. It was a big, uh, you know, I think as much as I'm talking about like specifically the wizardry series for role-playing games in general, this was a, it, this was a, uh, a tumultuous time because we, we're seeing a lot of the, a lot of the, the houses that RPGs built are, are going down, right? Like, you know, people are, people are moving away from these, you know, 70 hour RPGs. Um, and we're seeing games like Diablo come out that are really accessible, beautiful, play great. Uh, and, you know, and that's where the market's headed. And then, you know, going back to the Ultima series, um, Ultima goes to Ultima online, right? And even, you know, there's Ultima underworld. So 3d smooth scrolling engine and, or, you know, so, so I, I feel I feel that Ultima, ultimately the Ultima series did a better job at keeping pace with the industry and the challenges the industry, the, well, challenges, the opportunities that the industry had just in terms of massively multiplayer games and, um, you know, making games, you know, potentially sim- simpler and more accessible to a wider audience like Diablo did. And, you know, as much as I'm saying this, this isn't me trying to do, you know, armchair quarterbacking. Uh, you know, at the time, it's easy to look back and go, oh, yeah, you should have done that, you know. But at the time, um, this was it was a really uh, it was a really challenging time in the industry to really to figure out, like, what is the best direction to go? You know, and uh, there were a lot of people who put, you know, who put bets on the, you know, the non winning, the non winning side. But you know, ultimately, um, Wizardry Games ended up you know, ended up really paving the way for all CRPGs, you know, so they, so they certainly, not that they had that job to do, but, you know, the Wizardry games left their mark. And, um, you know, I, I, I think what they did was, was spectacular. Well, with kind of changing technology and changing gameplay, how important were manuals and, and, and guides to these games? And uh, what, what was your approach to letting new users know how to actually play them? Hmm. So, you know, back then with manuals and, you know, like, especially when I was in, uh, after I had made that, that fateful statement that I want to keep making games, I took whatever job was available. One of which was, uh, make writing the manuals for things. And, you know, an interesting thing I've had some, I've had some recent thought about that because right now I would say when people look at a video game, like let's just take a modern game, one of the most challenging aspects of the game to develop is the game's tutorial. And that's because the the mechanics of the game are often changing, you know, they're they're often changing, uh, getting refined, we'll say, up to you're pretty close to release, you know, like, um, and so the, we're basically stuffing the manual in the game itself with the tutorial and how to get started. And that, you know, that certainly uh, is, is a, well, it's, you know, pays out in different ways. I want to say like it raises the cost of production, but you know, if you're shipping a manual all over the world, that's certainly not cheap either. Um, but I feel that we've, we've, we've really just at this point in time in the industry, we have changed. Uh, we've, we've made the onboarding experience in the game itself. 
if games are sufficiently complex enough, they will end up with a wiki. And in many cases, the publisher assists in putting that together, like, you know, Paradox certainly did for Empire of Sin. Uh, but I do remember, I'm sure you guys remember this too, like when you would pick up a box and it would be heavy and you go, oh man, this is a good game. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You've got your money's way, worth. Oh yeah. And Sid Meier, nobody had a heavier manual than Sid Meier. He was known for heavy, heavy manuals. As technology grew and uh, stuff like the uh, PlayStation and next generation consoles like the Saturn came out, did you find that the fantasy genre was kind of getting a bit out of fashion? It was a really interesting time. And I think what was interesting about it is how uh, how it affected the culture of the game industry. Not so much the individual games, but where we... When uh, I, the easiest way to see it is to look at the it, to look at GDC. So GDC used to be known as the Computer Game Developers Conference, and there was a point in time when they decided to drop the computer portion of it. And there were outrage is too strong a term, but many stern conversations were had that by dropping the computer portion of that, we were letting in all that we were welcoming. In fact, all these console game creators. And that this was somehow going to ruin things, right? That these it, it, that these two sides, uh, these two oh, I shouldn't even say sides. I mean, these these two different ways of making games that somehow they didn't fit together. Somehow the players didn't, you know, they weren't the same audiences. They make on the one hand these are computer games, are more serious games, and like for actual aficionados in, in consoles or for kids. Mind you, everything I'm saying isn't actually my point of view. Um, but it was, it was really a, a tumultuous time. And I, and I even remember that it, that it got into the arguments around how video games should be rated uh, and who were, who would be making the choices, you know, like would, would the people who are console, you know, pr- primarily making console games, would they have an outsized opinion on on you know the people who made computer games, um, just in terms of how games would be rated, so uh, it, it it was you know that was in a lot not specifically RPGs that affected a lot of things. I think RPGs, and I'm I'm paraphrasing something that Richard Garriott said, um, which is people don't make RPGs for money, um, especially you know the hardcore traditional RPGs. Because they're big and they're sprawling and they're 70 hours. And, and it's not like you've just got, you know, it's not like you just have an adventure game. You do have an adventure game. Every, every element of an adventure game is absolutely in an RPG. But you've also got, you know, maybe you've got a turn-based combat game. Or, or, or maybe you've got, a, you know, like a, something that, that would be like a real-time uh, combat game. Though at that point in time, we wouldn't have, shooters would have just started. Um, yeah. with, uh, with Wolfenstein, but, but it was, you know, it, it, RPGs, you know, ultimately it was their scale and their scope and the difficulty in making them in the, uh, in, and they weren't the most popular genre of games. I mean, if you, you know, certainly once shooters took hold, you know, they became far and away the most popular version and RPGs also didn't have fantastic replayability because they were so story based. So I think they were really big, big scale RPGs were just them, you know, going out of fashion was a, just, uh, you know, a, a result really of, of larger changes taking place in the market of people wanting to play online together. So in, in MMOs, people wanting, uh, a, you know, a loads of content. And, you know, like if, if I look at World of Warcraft, you know, well, at, at its peak had like just a ridiculous amount of writers on staff to churn, you know, to churn that amount of content out. Um, but I, I think, you know, I think ultimately RPGs just became uh, you know, not a great business um, in, to get into if you if you wanted to make games. The the really big RPGs were, you know, that that's challenging to get somebody to to pick one of those up. Well, by the time we got to Nemesis, I mean, we had pre-rendered graphics yeah. in the game then. I mean, was that a big step up oh, huge, in yeah. the world of technology for Surtec? It was, yeah. I mean, Nemesis was, you know, Nemesis was, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, here's this company with, uh, with some you know, fantastic IP in terms of Jagged Alliance. And Jagged Alliance at that point in time, 
you know, that's in, um, you know, Ian Curry's hands and that game is doing really, really well. That Well, that franchise is doing really, really well. And now, I, mind you, I, I don't want to pretend that I was behind the scenes in, uh, you know, where they were uh, making these, where, where these decisions were made. Um, so anything I'm saying here is, is theory, but you know, Surtech had, you know, had this fantastic IP and what other ways could, could they use it? What other, you know, what other types of games could Wizardry potentially fit into? And uh, a graphical adventure game was certainly one of them. And so yeah, that's what they tried. Um, that's what they tried to do uh, with Nemesis. And I, and I think, you know, I think Nemesis was, uh, you know, certainly for its time, it was a beautiful game. So you're a writer on Jagged Alliance too. Um, how did you want to kind of improve this series and add your own mark on it? Um, well, you know, like I uh, playing Jagged Alliance, what I loved were, I, as many people did, I loved the characters in the game. Um, in fact, one of them, I, 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 at some point in time, must have said to Sean Ling that I thought Rudy, uh, who was a character in the game, I thought Rudy was hot. And next thing you know, I was a character in the game. Uh, so <laughs> a character in the game involved in a relationship with that self same character. Um, and uh, Buzz Garneau was my character, but uh, as is the case with many game companies, um, you know, in the, in the, well, Surtech couldn't have been really the early stages, but it was a small game company. Uh, so anybody, you know, if, if you had a skill at something, you were probably going to be brought in to, to do something with that. So, uh, so doing writing on Jagged Alliance, uh, I ended up moving up to Ottawa to do that. And Sean, so Sean, Sean Ling, who is one of the co-designers and a writer, um, a writer on the game, he just has such a great sense of humor. And I loved the characters. So, you know, coming into the game, my first goal really was to try to mimic his writing style. And, uh, and you know, then eventually it was just adding in my, my own humor. And because there were so many different characters, you, you could do that. I mean, you know, pretty much that's, that's what I did. And then I'm, you know, I'm sure I, if there was a game, uh, odds are I was going to also be drafted to write the manual for the game. And, and, you know, so that would have followed that. Well, obviously the, um, the last in the original Surtech Wizardry series was Wizardry 8 mm-hmm. um, that came out in 2001. I mean, obviously that being the final title in that series then, did you feel pressure to end it well? Was it like a big pressure on the team? You know, it, uh, no. And here's why, because I don't know that we really thought that was the end, right? Like we, um, we wanted to wrap it up. Uh, there had been a lot of loose ends that were left in Wizardry 6. Like, so keep, keep in mind Wizardry's history. There's, it, it, it's, it sometimes is referring to things, you know, that happened 10 years ago, right? Um, and and with Wizardry, there were things that uh, in Wizardry 6, you could bring certain items and characters into Wizardry 7. And then by the time we get to 7, you know, there were uh, there's somewhere I have a document that is pretty sizable uh, where I studied the entire structure. And I and I do mean like studied it like a, you know, a university thesis of what is every conceivable thread that was left hanging because as much as I was working on the design team for it, I was also, in, you know, pretty much as hardcore as you could get of a wizardry fan. So I um, wanted to make sure that, that this trilogy was finished up in like every, every tie, every, every, every thread was tied or whatever. Every thread was knotted or whatever I'm trying to say. Um, and so we knew we were going to do that. We knew we were going to, you know, bring it to the end. We were going to blow up the universe and, and like, move on you know and start start fresh and start anew and because when you're trying to finish up something that is relying on something that comes before you are you're also while that's great but you're also encumbered by some of that so we really wanted to take it in a new direction and there exists somewhere design docs um you know preliminary ideas of what wizardry 9 could be so it was only you know at the at the end of wizardry 8 when Wizardry 8 itself uh, had difficulty, you know, it's, it had difficulty getting picked up. And, you know, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what those conversations would have been or what the difficulty was, but you know, ultimately Wizardry ended up being released directly by Electronics Boutique um, and, you know, went on to get five RPG of the year awards. So it wasn't, it wasn't the game's quality. Uh, so I'm not really sure. I, anyway, I don't know what it was. It's just the market at the time, I guess, but I don't think the team knew 
You know, like we we weren't making that game. We put everything we had into that game. It was absolutely a labor of love. Uh, but I don't think we knew that that was going to be it. Uh, and it, I certainly I didn't. And I remember um, I remember uh, as as is was as is the case many times. I had actually planned a pregnancy around the launch of the game. So my child was due after the game launched, and this made perfect sense to me. But what ended up what ended up happening uh, was, as is often the case, is the game was delayed, but the child wasn't. So I was on maternity leave, and I called Surtech, uh, spoke to either Linda or Ian, just to say, by the way, I'm, you know, I'm just going to take a little bit long. I, I had the kid, and I'm going to be just taking a little bit longer. I'm on maternity leave, and I just like to talk about that. And they, they let me know, you know, that they were planning to uh, lay people off um, uh, later that day. I think. You know, and it was just like a, just a huge shock, just a huge shock that, that 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 was happening. So maybe it wasn't as big as a shock to people who were in the company at the time, but it sure was to me. Well, testament to that game, um, the fans have kind of modded it and taken it to the next level. Have you heard of stuff like uh, W8Go, which is a complete uh, overhaul of uh, Wizardry 8 and, uh, you know, lots of these modifications that are still going on today? I I know that there's I know that there's a really uh, a large um, I'm just googling what you said now isn't this hold on now I can't help but looking absolutely not at all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely that was not the website okay all right let's go back to the uh, we'll go back to the actual <laughs> point here isn't that funny anyway so I know that there's a huge fan base because every once in a while I'll get some kind of email that's like that's this big plea to get the team back together to make another wizardry series, another wizardry game of, of some kind. Um, and I think, you know, maybe I, I don't really know why, why I get the emails. Maybe it's just because, you know, many of the original core design team have, you know, are, 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 you know, just not out there on social media or whatever. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm well aware that there's there's still a lot of love for, for a lot of love for the game, and I you know I still I I will always be incredibly proud um, of that game and, and how it turned out, and uh, you know also having the chance to like I never would have thought you know I never would have thought that I would have happened, had an opportunity you know to contribute that to that series is you know uh, as much as I did you know what a what a tremendous blessing that was. Well, obviously, your career has gone from strength to strength. I mean, you're actually a BAFTA winner as well. I mean, tell us about that. What was kind of your, re- your reaction when you oh, found that out? Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, my reaction when I found that out was I, the first reaction I had was this is fake um, because they sent me an email. Uh, it, it was a letter. So the email was actually, you know, there's a letter attached and you click on it and I opened it. And it just, I can't, I can't even remember what the letter said, uh, although I do have it framed. Um, they, it said, you know, basically that they wanted to award me a BAFTA special award and they, you know, they hoped I would accept and, uh, and please uh, keep this quiet until we announce it. And I, I remember um, when I read it, uh, the only reason, like it had to be fake, right? You know, and it had to be fake, especially when I think about, um, you know, because I know a lot of people who who I who I believe have contributed to games far more substantially than I have, like like you know my husband, you know for instance, and and so it just felt unreal to me. And I actually everybody I know who's won a BAFTA says the exact same thing. So I I believed at first I thought it was fake, uh, and then but I the thing that kept me from just deleting it was that I had previously. You know, I I went to a BAFTA event in um, Los Angeles where they were introducing games as a pillar of BAFTA, right? It was going to be film, TV, and games. And I thought, to me, that was the most exciting thing, the most culturally exciting thing that had happened for games, that we were being accepted up there with other forms of of, uh, screen entertainment. And so it, it was, just, it was, it was a, it was a critical moment for the industry culturally. And I recognized the font. So I knew that BAFTA is a really unique font and I knew the font I was looking at was theirs. Um, so I think I, if I remember right, I, I, I said, I asked John to come, come over and I didn't show him cause we had an, we still do have an open office, like 
you know, it's like a, um, a open plan office. And I said to him, I, I, I remember just saying, I think I just want a bath there. Uh, and he's, you know, he's my one man, um, fan club, uh, president and founder of it. And so he was, he was just <laughs> as excited as could be, uh, that I wanted. I still, you know, it's on, I have it here at home. Um, it's on a shelf, uh, on my bookshelves. And every once in a while, I'll just be like, Jesus, I want a bath there. I mean, it's ridiculous. Pinch yourself. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, like it's, this is who, who would have thought, especially, um, you know, people like, uh, you know, my brother, you know, with whom I'm, I'm really close with my brother, you know, and he just, you know, he knows, he knows where we come from, uh, you know, knows our, our, you know, our family's pretty humble beginnings and who would have thought, man, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I mean, that's just, that's the truth there. Well, Brenda, obviously, you know, with the start of 2021 now, the last 12 months have been very unusual for the whole world. I mean, what's kind of next for you then? What What's coming up this year from you? Well, this year I am still, I would say, dedicated to Empire of Sin. You know, games don't just come out and you walk away from them at this point in time. Um, so I'm. we just released a big update for Empire of Sin. Uh, we have a uh, another one coming and uh behind this behind our recording screen here i have uh the design docs for dlc uh so uh, lots of stuff planned there's a good long tail for empire of sin and then i don't know like right now i'm still fascinated with prohibition era chicago so we'll see what takes my um you know we'll see what takes my fa fascination next i guess Fantastic. Well, listen, Brenda, it's been incredible having you on and thank you so much for uh, being our guest this week and uh, sharing some of your amazing stories. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much.